You are listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of icmforum.com. Welcome back, everyone. And yes, this is real. We are going to talk about the period in Godard's career many of his ardent fans actively ignore. It's a little bit like a black box of secret films this next to no one has seen. No, no, seriously, when you hear people talk about Godard, it's like he died in 1967, or, or at the very least lived in comatose until the 1980s. And this is why this is such an exciting part of his life and career to finally be able to talk about in detail and break down a little bit. Now, Jean-Luc Godard is, at least to many, the very embodiment of the cinematic auteur. And, and that's fitting. He was instrumental, both as a critic and theorist with Coherence to Cinema, and as a director, in pushing the author theory, which changed how so many people view cinema, placing the director as the sole, or at least most significant artist within the creation of a film, and the film as his or her vision. It's therefore a little bit curious, if not just plain ironic, that essentially his entire body of work in the 1970s is defined by collaboration. I mean, going to such an extreme length that several of these films do not even carry his name. So what happened? Well, May 1968. Strike, student uprising, revolution in the air. Godard went from you know, participating in Cannes to protest in Cannes and essentially playing one of the central roles in shutting it down for the year. This was the year he also made his very first uncredited work, Cinetracts, a collection of short political essays. He's admitted several, and others, including Resnack, also contributed. It depicted real images from the protests and the clashes between strikers, protesters, and the police. Jean-Pierre Gorin also contributed. And remember that name. In many ways, Godard cinema grew smaller, which is a little bit ironic given the documentary about Roy Jones, Sympathy for a Devil, you know, in the midst of all of this. But the joy of learning were literally just two people in a room, and they ironically name a film like any other is literally just students and workers sitting in a field and with no faces shown. The focus became clearer and clearer political agitation, socialism, Marxism, and revolution. We can neatly separate this period into two sections, his work with the Siga Wörter Group and his films with Anne-Marie Miville. Godard, Gorin, and others formed the Marxist-Leninist-Maoist collective, the Siga Wörter Group, named after the father of Soviet montage. And together, depending on how you count, they made five to nine films. They unleashed a form of cinematic exploration that is almost unparalleled, crafting cinematic essays coupled with complete disdain for any conventions or, or decorum, for that matter. In 1971's Vladimir et Rusa, Godard and Gurin unzipped their pants to pull out video cameras. That very same Brechtian focus of distancing the viewer entirely from the screen and asking them to think critically about what they were watching was taken to some of its most extreme limits. And then we see quite a colossal shift in the cinema after the group disbanded in 1972. We rapidly move away from direct political agitation and towards a far more intimate and personal, yet somehow even more distanced style. In 1973, he formed the production company Sonny Marsh with Mieville, and they started exploring and experimenting with the image itself. You, you can easily see how Mieville impacted Godard's work far more than the Ziga Werther Group as a whole, as it plays into so much of his later career. We start to see the play and projection, video art, TVs brought in and the kind of framing and telling stories and essays that grip you in a kind of odd, unusual intensity. In this episode, we will try to understand why so many fans 
act as if John Luc Godard died in 1967, perhaps enveloped in a car crash similar to the beginning of Weekend, or at the very least, again, laid in that coma until the 1980s. We will dive deeper into the two Godard films that still get held up by critics and remain respected. The revolutionary Toto Bien with Yves Montand and Jane Fonda, and the far more low-key Numero Dupes, a study of the power relations within a family. Both present on the Day Street Pictures Dante's top 1,000 best films of all time. We have also singled out Wind from the East as one of the clearest examples of the work of the Siga Werder Group. Joining me today are Clement, Mathieu and Saul. And to just get this conversation started, what was your very first reaction to seeing Godard's 1970s work? Hi, I'm Mathieu from France. My first reaction to Godard's 70s work was actually my first reaction to Godard. For some strange reason, Numero 2 was actually the first Godard film I ever saw. The reasons for that involve random.org and uh, my willingness to explore cinema in a random way. Obviously, I was aware of what Godard was, and I was aware that his 70s work was different from his 60s work. But still, I was amazed by the willingness to experiment with the cinematic language and very pleasantly surprised by the playfulness that went along with the, the kind of self-seriousness I expected. Hi, it's Sol from Australia. I think this is going to be an interesting topic to discuss because even though I'd been watching um, Goddard films for pretty much the whole of my cinematic journey, I would have seen Breathless around 18 or 19 years ago. It's actually only this year with his 70s films being released on movie that I've actually got a chance to watch some 70s Goddard. I've seen three from the 70s now. Even though I'd seen most of his 60s films before this year, I hadn't seen a single film that he'd done in the 1970s. It's an interesting period to look at because obviously Godard has progressed a lot as a filmmaker over the years. And I think coming to his 70s work as an experienced cinephile, his work is really interesting to look at because it challenges the medium in different ways that maybe we wouldn't have thought possible before. Hello, this is Clem from France. My first reaction watching his films from the 70s was, well, it's obvious that this is Godard. But at the same time, I think Godard is one of those filmmakers that has real progression. And I think that uh, his films should be watched in order because there are real phases in his uh, work. And I think the 70s is uh, a phase on its, uh, its own. I definitely agree with Clem that Godard is an interesting filmmaker. In part, the progress we can see, not necessarily the progress, the arc we can see in his films, the evolution that is very apparent. And I think that's the case with the films we'll talk about in this episode. And what about you, Chris? What was your first experience with uh, Godard's 70s films? Well, I actually saw quite a few of these long before they came to movie, but in, in much poorer quality and, and before I had any knowledge of you know, the kind of politics that Godard was talking about. And I think it's interesting that they still work for me because I've always been so fascinated by the type of formatic focus that Godard has, you know, the kind of rework films and find different ways to make films interesting. But what I didn't realize, because, because at the time they just seemed mad and idiosyncratic, is that once you actually know what he's talking about, they become a lot more streamlined, they become a lot more understandable. So they're not as mad and comical as originally thought. Seeing them again now that they're on movie, I, th- I think it, it showcased that you know, it's not just Godard being you know, crazy and creative, it also showcases the kind of political interest he had. And I think that was the main takeaway for me this time around. And, and bringing us over to, to the next question, how would you describe Godard's 70s work, especially to someone who hasn't seen any of it? Do you think Godard fans thinking about venturing past 1967, especially you know, if, if they're going to be jumping in before the 1980s, need to be prepared in some way? Well, I think that if they're a fan of Godard, they know what to expect because they know that he's the type of filmmaker that is always trying to um, push the boundaries I guess his 70s period is a period that um, fits 
well between the 60s and the 80s. I guess the 70s is a little bit more experimental than the 60s. His late 60s work, obviously, we mentioned The Weekend, but we can also mention The, the Chinese, are films that um, are starting to experiment with sound and uh, images and uh, a different kind of storytelling. And I would say that his work in the 70s takes those concepts and takes them even further away and add an extra political layer, that, which is obviously because May 68 happened between Weekend that was released in uh, 1967 and the rest of his filmography. It's interesting to hear about the politics in Goddard's work because I'm pretty sure he's said before is quoted as saying that all film is political and I would say even the early 60s films some films like a petite soldat have got some very strong political overtones or undertones in them however you want to look at it I'd say all of his films were political but definitely in the 1970s um, seems to become more pronounced in terms of preparation I don't know if Godard fans need to be prepared before going in to see his 70s films. Anybody who's seen a number of films he's done in the 1960s knows that he likes pushing the envelope. If you've seen some of his later films from the 80s and later, there's a lot of wordplay in there. He loves wordplay. But when I sat down and I watched Uva Bienna and Nimro Du, they were very impressive, but they weren't mind blowing in that I was sort of expecting something like that from Godard. It wasn't um, wasn't unexpected what it was doing. It was still impressive, but it, I don't think it's something where I needed to be prepared for it before going into seeing it. The only thing would be the politics. The politics do come out very strong, but it's the same for a lot of his work from the 80s or beyond. So if you'd seen any of his films from the 80s or 90s, things like Forever Mozart, which I recently watched a movie also, which is very you know, against um, Swiss neutrality and the Bosnian War and everything. There's a lot of politics in there. So I don't think any of it was too surprising. But that's just my take on it. If we're talking about someone who's a fan of Godard from the 60s and who's only seen that, I do think it's, they should maybe be warned to a certain extent. Uh, certainly, they would be ready for some experimentation. Godard did that in the 60s, but he did go much further in the 70s. I also would say that the politics show up in a very different manner. They're present again in the 60s, and I would actually certainly agree with Godard saying uh, that all film is political, but these films are much more explicitly political to the point that it's certainly not necessary, but some passing familiarity with Marxism-Leninism might be helpful. <laughs> I, certainly it helps kind of understand, especially the Ziga Vertov films. Yeah, I think I agree with all of you, actually. I think that if you, as a Godard fan, you followed his career up in 67, and you saw Machinois, you, you saw Weekend, and two or three things I know about her, and, and you kind of imagine that you mingle those together and add in more political agitation, you're pretty much there. You, you will know more or less what to expect from his 70s work. That the only thing I would say is you should probably jump over a couple of his 60s films and start with Sigurd of stuff because like if you look at for instance the very first film that's in some ways accredited as a Sigurd uh, film but was released as a Godard film which is a film like any other that was in some ways just like like it, it's an it, it's an interesting conversation on the field that's all they do they sit in the field you don't see faces you you, you may get something out of it but, but just to throw in a little anecdote, when that film was shipped to English-speaking audiences, the audio was ruined just to troll Godard fans abroad. It doesn't make any sense whatsoever, but you saw him do the same thing with Film Socialisma in 2010, you know, adding Navajo subtitles. So, like, just if you just want to get a more of a continuous journey, jump along to, you know, the main Zigarota group of the 70s, and it will seem a lot smoother, I would say. I guess one obvious difference would be to just to say that his 70s films are almost all, if not all, essay films, which you cannot say of his earlier films. That is a pretty substantial difference and something that I think is worth 
maybe mentioning to someone who is venturing into that. Yeah, that's so true as well. I mean, I think you saw some essay aspects in this early work, especially on Twitter things. But yeah, that, that's really one of the main distinctions. And they also have a lot more of a niche outlook. Like, like you mentioned, Mathieu, like, if you don't know anything about Marxism or you don't know anything about Marxism and Leninism, like, these films might just seem completely impenetrable and confusing and, and bizarre, even more so than some of his earlier work. And, and I suppose this also ties us over to my last question before we actually started, which is, why do you think Godard's work in the 1970s was almost impossible to see until this point? and was, you know, dismissed or even directly disliked by so many, even good art fans, up until this point? Well, I think it has to do with both the form and the content, but it, it's, it's much, much more difficult to access. So obviously that's going to be less, less interesting for providers like Mubi and others to give because it's just the number of people who might watch it is reduced. So just, I mean, economically, it's not as viable. But I also think that among Godard fans, the reason why they would reject it is that many people love Godard for formal reasons, right? For how his films look, for his talents as a filmmaker. And a lot of his, of these films, even though they still do show that talent and that interest in form, the content is much more front loaded. And again, the politics are front loaded. And I think that is a big turn off for many people, especially because they are quite radical politics. I would probably agree about the politics and the heavy handedness of the politics being one of the main reasons why 70s work was maybe overlooked a bit until now. Like uh, Matthew said, I'd say also the reason why people would like Goddard films would be for things like Breathless, The Our Girl, The Gun, things like Alphaville and creating an exciting adventure. Things like Contempt is all about the film industry. So, of course, film fans are going to want to go out in droves to see that. So I think with a lot of the 70s films, when it became more about the politics, rather than about creating that you know, adventure, girl gun, that's all that you need to be able to create an interesting film. I think that's maybe when people started to go away. I'm not quite sure why his 80s work is a lot more available than his 70s work. I know a lot of his 80s films have been released on DVD in Australia and none of his 70s work has. Although I guess maybe with the controversy of things like Hail Mary, maybe that provoked a bit more general interest in his work. Yeah, I would agree with both of you. Another thing also that we could mention is that uh, his films from the 70s, where well, most of them were not made under his name, under Godard's name, but um, under Group Tsika Vertov. And... Maybe for some, they saw it as um, films that are not, well, that have Godard involved. But um, since, so it was not only Godard, it was also people involved. And uh, maybe in the first place, some people didn't associate Godard with this group. And those who did maybe were afraid that Godard didn't have enough room to work and it wouldn't feel like a Godard film enough for them to enjoy them. Even though I read somewhere that uh, Godard had a very, very huge impact on the making of all of those films, but uh, I could maybe see someone before the internet searching for films and just seeing these uh, films made by Rob Tsikavertov and probably not necessarily associating it with uh, Godard. I think it's an interesting point you make, Clem, about Goddard's name not being very pronounced or that it's going under a completely different name in the 1970s. And it's an interesting point about the collaboration because obviously Goddard did a lot of anthology films in the 1960s. I don't know how to pronounce that. Like there's one that he did with uh, Pasolini and Rossellini and a few other directors. And therefore, for Goddard fans, when they go in to watch it, would have only been seeing a snippet of it. So if they see his name listed with a whole lot of other directors, maybe people in the 1970s were like, oh, you know, it's just going to be one segment out of a whole bunch of segments rather than something which is purely Godard's vision. I think as far as how they were received at the time, it also, I think, has to do with the general way that uh, we moved away from May 68. I think, I mean, we can get into that a little later, but uh, I think Godard was not in vogue, basically, in the 70s. He was seen as 
someone who stayed in the 60s maybe even though he clearly didn't in terms of what the, what his films were i think there's a bit of that as well yeah, i think those are all really really great points and while obviously it work was credited under the Ziga Vertical Group. It's really important to know that Godot was, first of all, the only key director involved in all of these films. And usually it would be him and one other director working on the same time, usually him and Gorin. So you can still feel in essentially every way that this is a Godard film, at, at least in most of the cases. But while Wind from the East clearly takes on so many of the ideas he had been pushing before it does take them to another extreme and interestingly in terms of collaboration it has one scene in the middle of it all where the entire cast and crew start talking about how the film is done what images they use what images they represent within the film and it showcases a kind of spontaneous collaborative effort that really strike a blow to the art author theory, if you will. But what is Wind from the East and why is it so interesting? Why did we pick it to discuss today? Uh, and I would say that one of the main ways is that it stripped down everything a film can be. It does actually have one of the biggest Italian stars at the time, Gian Maria Volante, who you, Western audiences especially will know from The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and for a few dollars more, but was so many incredible Italian films. Uh, and here he's essentially just walking about with a gun, sometimes with a cowboy hat, representing this kind of state mercenary violence. And everything around him is stripped down. Violence is essentially represented by throwing red paint at people. And once again, like essentially all of Godard films, it is a political essay. It is agitation propaganda. What is so interesting here is that you have these I would say, passionate speeches essentially placed over cinematic footage, often just with people being prepared for the filming and eating. And it has this kind of semi-ironic contrast, which we can see so strongly in Godard's previous work as well. And it even has a pretty extreme premise, which is very interesting for anyone, you know, fascinated by film history and film theory, which is that any films focusing on narrative and character essentially becomes part of this broader spectacle. And they go full on a full frontal attack against Soviet cinema as well, essentially showcasing that the only cinema that is to them at this point in time valuable is the kind of cinema that attaches you from the screen and makes you think about what you are seeing again in the purest brechtian tradition i know that especially Mathieu and i will disagree many ways about this film and i think this will be a really exciting discussion so let's get started with Mathieu. well um so i think le vent d'est or the wind from the east is uh, godard and i think goran at the point where they think that cinema, as you mentioned, and perhaps even all art forms, or at least all pictural art, is inherently bourgeois, capitalist, and conservative. And the film even refers to the birth of photography as the origin of that. This film feels like the result of that realization. Right? It both aims to present the theory that all cinema is representation and that representation is basically capitalist, and it also wants perhaps to refute it by offering something new, something revolutionary that will be a new leftist cinema or more politically responsible cinema. I would argue that in that respect, it's a failure, at least for me. I think one of the main issues is baked within the Ziga Vertov Group project. And I think you can see this in how the film attacks the notions of self-management and uh, general assembly. You have a bunch of political sensibilities part of this project here, including an actual political leader of the May 68 movement, Daniel Cohn-Bendit. He's actually credited as a screenwriter, and he is probably not that well known outside of France, but in France, he is basically the most famous um, young person to come out of that movement. And you also have Italian Red Brigade member. So it's basically a hodgepodge of 
political sensibilities. And the result is, as Godard himself might put it, a disconnect between sound and image, at least for me. The images are the result of the group's endeavor. Apparently, one of the ideas was to make a leftist spaghetti western starring Gian Maria Volonte, for example. But the sound, and perhaps crucially the editing, feels all Godard and Gorin. And at this point, they have no interest in narrative cinema, as, as we said, as in representation, as they put it. So you've got these images and this long political monologue by Anne Wiesemski, and they do use the images to illustrate some of the points they're making about cinema. I think, Chris, you mentioned the violence being illustrated by this wet paint, essentially, which is essentially how it's done in cinema always, but it's very obvious here. But to me, it feels very disjointed, not very coherent, perhaps because they simply haven't resolved their core issue. They've Id identified all the ways in which cinema is politically invalid for them, and they've ended up with nothing left. It's a cinematic dead end. The General Assembly sections, with which Chris mentioned, in which we hear the group members disagreeing, they feel like Godard is trying to win arguments after the fact to the power of editing. And all of that is very interesting as a cultural artifact, both in terms of Godard's personal journey and the broader left intelligentsia's post-68 malaise, but I don't find it successful at all as a film. And it doesn't help that I personally find the political content that this lands on to be kind of vile, essentially regurgitating Maoist propaganda, at one point demeaning political opponents of Mao. So uh, if I thought that this was more formally successful, maybe I could look past that. And there's also always a way you can argue that what is being said in the film is not necessarily what the film wants to say. But I think because there is this disconnect for me, it ends up just, just being some kind of Maoist propaganda, which I don't care for. I, I think the main difference between how the two of us successful we thought the form was, because I was personally just blown away by the kind of cinematic intensity and the kind of cinematic exploration that went on here. I, I just love this form of anti-cinema where everything is stripped bare you're constantly considering each aspect of the film and there's so much playfulness. You have all of the main things that you love about Godard from the 60s, but it's really brought together by this disconnect between what we are told, what we are seeing. I love the fact that it's split in the middle where it also critiques the film up until that point. But I also think you're absolutely correct in that this is in so many ways, Maoist propaganda, even though Godard may have started to change his mind slightly in the editing room, or at least had this agreement with many of the proponents, which clearly played out in the editing room as well. So you get this really interesting film that's, that has a lot of points. It has a lot of really intriguing film theory, a lot of really intriguing realization of that film theory, but then also attempts to be really clear cut political agitation and to the latter point I, I i do agree i don't think it is for people who aren't actually marxist Leninist maoists already like and i guess this ties in with 68 as well where you had you know the typically marxist student but you had the syndicalist unions clashing and you have points in this film where you know they're, they're essentially ripping apart syndicalism and presenting marxism as the only way but but their argument for it is essentially just it's not marxism that's literally the extent of their argument which comes across as so silly and thin which I guess for me personally salvaged doesn't buy the scope of the cinematic exploration but yeah I can see how so many people will be turned off by that. Uh, it's also worth noting, though, that uh, the Singapore group actually toured with these films, showing them at unions and student groups, etc., and that we can probably assume that the target audience already had an inclination to agree with them, which is a really interesting part of this as well. Okay, I'll just address something completely different from uh, what you two talked about. Um, is the Western aspect of the film. As um, you said, Chris, I think, the film revolves around this almost Western type of story featuring this uh, prisoner that is being held captive by um, Maria Volonté. 
who, as you said, was pretty big back then for starring in um, Western. And I think it's interesting to see that he would take this very American and Occidental type of film that is Western and to use this kind of parody in a film that is called Wind from the East. Yeah, so I agree that it's interesting to take the Western, which is this quintessential American thing, and especially when the film is called, as you, as you mentioned, uh, Wind from the East, there's this opposition between West and East, which is political, which is certainly something Godard cares about a lot. I think that's actually in many spaghetti Westerns, this kind of element of taking the American myth and re-exploring it in a different political way. However, I'm a little curious about what you guys think about the actual content here and how it relates to what Godard is doing. Aside from the violence uh, and the general notion of representation being illustrated with this Western, do you see a particular point in what is told in this Western semi-story? I think that the plot itself, like a meta context in such an extent that the Western story itself doesn't really matter. But still there are elements that are carried through this. You do have the, what we can say, the Marxist intellectual who is, you know, this traitor to the movement. And you do have various forms of repressed people, which in one scene, you know, when they hang out and but literally hang, they've been, they've been uh, violently assaulted and they have this talk of what they've done, you know, they shot the sheriff of West Berlin, etc. And they eventually realize they have all of the same enemies uh, before they rise up. So there's obviously a teen illustration of the, the lower class getting together and rising up, but, but that's the extent of it, really. And of course, Jan Maria Volonta is, again, the representation of the, the enforcement of the law and of the violence with the... Marxist intellectual as a uh, ally. Though personally, uh, like what really works here for me, especially with the Western, is really the formatic exploration, where you do take you know, the spaghetti Western, but you strip it all back with the theory of you know, breaking away from narrative, breaking away from characters, focusing in on these distancing effects, which regardless of how you think the message itself worked, I really think those effects work. I think that they challenge the medium in such a way you haven't really seen before, even in Godard's work. And uh, that's the main reason why it works so incredibly well for me. And just to conclude on the Western aspect, it's also interesting to note that uh, Global Rocha plays a part in uh, the film. I'm not a big fan of his... Uh, films but i definitely did get a vibe of his uh, his films in uh, wind from the east uh, especially uh, his film from uh, 1969 antonio das mortes they were probably both shot at the same time but i just felt that uh, there was this experimental type of um, western vibe in uh, wind from the east that uh, would also later be found in um, Rodorowski, uh, Western in the 70s. So maybe Wind from the East had uh, a bit more impact on uh, Western from the 70s that we may have thought at first. So uh, I didn't actually end up seeing Wind from the East. Uh, what you guys have said about the film makes it sound really intriguing. I am not a fan of film minimalism in general. But what Matthew has said about the film in particular, even though I saw he gave it one star on Letterboxd, actually fascinates me the most about it. So I do look forward to sitting down and watching at some stage, at which case I'll be able to then get back to you guys about it. Really looking forward to that, Saul. And to take us over to the next film we'll be talking about, Tuva Bien, what we're seeing here is really interesting because essentially it is a more mainstream, a more broad way of implementing the same political ideas as Wind from the East and the earlier Ziga World Up group. And the group was still involved here. But unlike the group's mantra of being credited as a whole, the film is credited as being directed by Godard and Gorin. And of course, it stars Yves Montand and Jane Fonda, now being you know, one of the biggest stars in France and one of the biggest stars in the US at the time. 
it's clear that unlike the earlier work, which is quite niche and clearly targeted towards people already close to the position of zero vertebra group, this film has a much broader appeal. It doesn't take the same hard line. Where in Wind from the East, you know, anything that's not Marxist is essentially discarded as, you know, just trash. Here you have characters repeating, you don't have to be a leftist or you don't even have to be on the left to think these things. So it's trying to genuinely reach out to the French people. Stylistically, it's also a lot more consumable whilst keeping certain Brechtian techniques and playing with the form. And I think there's this really interesting fun play here going all the way back to two or three things I know about her where it just starts with this idea of making a film you know you see the checks being written out you see them talking about where you can place the film and already now you know these little ideas of workers and farmers etc play in you just see shots of them completely unrelated as they try to work out what it will be until they zoom in on our two lead characters him and her At the start, you don't even necessarily know that you'll be in for something overtly political. I mean, you might have guessed knowing what Godard has been doing, but you're just introduced to these two characters who then suddenly get involved by by accident in a, it's going to call it a factory city, but it's essentially a factory takeover where they get trapped in the office with the general manager for several days. And you have this kind of exploration where you see the striking workers, the kind of conversations between the boss and the workers. Now, what's really interesting is the clarity, because where Godard's earlier work is quite obviously very focused on the Marxist theory, but also very idiosyncratic. Here it's very clear, and it's even relatively fair. He lets the boss give probably one of the best liberal arguments against socialism in terms of the rising living standards for the workers, etc. You let the union come in uh, against this more violent or more extreme action. You try to calm them down, get them back into the union lines, giving really clear good arguments why it's good to show a united front, argue reasonably, etc. And you get the workers themselves are just frustrated by their conditions about how nothing changes, how unions are no longer scary, while also showcasing their own inability to really express these ideas, which is a really interesting part of this film. And, and together with the colors and the creativity and the messaging, it's clear that this is one of Godard's most accessible films of the period, and uh, clearly one of the most beloved films of the period as well. So let's just all dive into what this film does, what it did well, if it worked for you at all, starting with Saul. I really love To Varbian. It's my favorite film whose title I can't pronounce properly. It's a very interesting film because like Chris said, it's a lot about its own inception from writing the checks needed to make a movie to the movie actually occurring. A lot of it's also about a film sets and the way films are constructed. There's an open dollhouse view of the offices when the trapped in there. They're sort of seeing it sideways, like the building's being cut in half. We're looking and seeing all these different levels at once. The open dollhouse structure was, of course, used by Jerry Lewis in The Ladies' Man in 1961. And it's something where you can really see that the French critics who are praising Lewis have sort of taken these things on board. And it's very interesting to see that structure in there because the factory boss tin, they're like scurrying about like mice in there. And everything looks really strange and like very comical from a distance. But obviously they're very stressed out at the same time. It is interesting, like Chris mentioned, they're trapped in there for days. I don't remember offhand if we're given a specific amount of time, but everything very quickly turns to chaos. Everything gets scattered everywhere. Everything becomes a complete mess. So it's sort of like even though they're at the head and they're in control of everything, when they get trapped inside, they're forced to stay in the same environment as their workers, not able to cope with any of that. And, of course, the comical highlight of the film is the boss not being able to find anywhere to urinate and eventually having to smash open a window in desperation just so he doesn't end up urinating all over the ground. 
So uh, lots of really interesting humor in there. And a lot of it was, uh, I think, borderline even absurdist, a little bit surreal. It's not quite realistic. It's a little bit more over the top. But uh, just in order to sort of like give that political message forward about the fact that those who are up there in control actually aren't really in control. And when a union strike does take over, they kind of sort of lose control and everything basically goes to hell. That so we mentioned earlier that Godard, uh, his career, has an arc to it. And I think it's very clear over the three films we are mostly talking about here. And Tout va bien is very clearly an evolution from the Zigavertov stuff. I think one of the key things happening is that over the, these three films, Godard is kind of reclaiming his status as an auteur. He's just part of the group in the previous film. Now he's just collaborating with Gorin, and it, he shows up in some sense personally much more, even though he's not literally on screen, I don't think. There's the way that he introduces the film, uh, along with the female voiceover. I think that's Annie Um Yeah, I, th I think it's just much more effective for me as a way to broach the divide between the people talking and the people they're talking to. There's a conflict here with that, that is addressed very directly, that is that Godard is an intellectual and that the way he speaks about these political issues is very alienating. It's only talking to intellectuals, essentially. And I think that's the case with the Zigavertov films. And I think with, with Tu Bien, taking these big stars, who are leftist stars, it does matter, I think. And this more conventional narrative, it allows him to at least theoretically speak to a much broader audience and speak more emotionally. And I think we see that in the way he approaches the strikers. This is overall a much more even-handed film than Le Vendest. It's not as much of a thesis film. It feels more like an actual essay, an actual way to ask questions politically rather than providing answers. As Chris mentioned, you have the boss making his case for liberalism. You also have the union delegate making his own case. And you have the workers making their own. I do think Godard's heart is much closer to the workers, but as opposed to the previous film where, as Chris mentioned, some ideas are just rejected out of hand because they're not part of the group that Godard belongs to. And especially, you, have, you already have in, in the other film this conflict between the actual workers and the unions, that the unions are this institution that in the end is also suppressive. I think Godard still thinks that, and I think this is still present in this film. But... As a viewer, you have more leeway to actually see these issues play out and to make your own mind. You have these people presented as people. It's more humanistic as a film, which I think I respond to much more. I just thought I might respond to something which Matthew said there. He said it was a good idea having these big name actors in there, like Jane Fonda, a leftist act actress, to sort of appeal to a broader spectrum of film goers. However, I sort of feel that if somebody really liked Cat Blue, if somebody really liked Clute, sat down to watch uh, Tuva Bian, I think they would be, you know, absolutely confounded at what they're watching. I don't know if they'll enjoy it, but it is definitely an interesting casting decision. Having these two big names in uh, the film was a great way for uh, Godard to have his film talk about because uh, from what I remember both of these uh, actors are not very used to playing in this type of um, films so it was uh, certainly very interesting to see them in uh, a more essay type of film. I have to say that overall Tout va bien didn't do much for me. Uh, it had a few interesting ideas that I really liked. I liked the very first scene, the intro, where it says that um, to make a film, you need money, and uh, you see them uh, writing checks to uh, everyone uh, involved in the film. Uh, I feel like it really shows how much money it's uh, needed to make films, and that uh, not everyone can uh, can afford it uh, at the time. I think, as you said, everyone gets to make their point, and it's a film that is a bit more um, conventional and straightforward in its uh, message. You also have um, scenes towards the end of the film, I think, where we, we have a brief uh, view of uh, the working conditions 
even though the passages shown are very brief, you can feel how alienating the work looks, how repetitive the tasks are. There is also uh, the supermarket scene at the end, which I thought was interesting. This few minutes scene that just showcases people with their carts in this uh, supermarket filled with any type of products. It also features this guy trying to sell his uh, leftist book right in the supermarket, which is strange because it's definitely not the type of place you would uh, expect to see that and uh, expect people to be receptive. So yeah, it has some good ideas, but for some reason it didn't really work out for me. I guess maybe it's because it was more uh, conventional that is also from this uh, period. I guess I was um, a bit less uh, focused on the story. But I think that uh, it could be a good uh, introduction to uh, this period from Godard. I'm sorry to hear that you didn't like uh, the film more, Clem. But I do really like the fact you mentioned the supermarket scene. That's really stuck really firmly ingrained in my mind in the weeks since viewing the film. And just the whole way the supermarket was filmed with this elongated tracking shot just reminded me a lot about the 1967 Goddard film Weekend, which is all about this long traffic jam due to a road accident. And when I saw it, that's what immediately sprung to mind. So for me, that was like Goddard's commentary on what the supermarket culture is like, what the mass music factory culture is like. It's a lot like a traffic jam. It's a lot of like a road accident. It's something which is like really clogged up and which isn't really natural to the flow and the order of things in society yet, and yet it's something that we rely upon. I don't really want to undersell To Bien as a film that's not experimental or interested in form because it still does a lot of really creative work even though it is clearer and more accessible. Even in the conversations within the factory, you know, you will have Dane Fonda as a journalist ask people questions. And instead of hearing her ask and seeing the person respond, it's shot slightly distorted. And you have one of the people watching this unfolding, describing it. And you have all of these scenes where they're playing around with what you see, who's speaking. And you do have those shots towards the end, like the supermarket scene which are just these fantastic tractors going back and forth as the scene develops. Uh, and I think that it does a lot of really great work. So if you're interested in Godard from a perspective of form, I still think you can get a lot out of it. I really want to dive into the supermarket scene and a plot that kind of ties in with the film as a whole. It's this conversation that's had earlier in the film, which says that the union wants to control your life from you know eight to five, and the party wants to control everything else and throughout the film you kind of have this dissenting opinion and this very soft critique of both the unions and you know the communist and the socialist parties as stagnating the socialist project and holding the workers down and the film is essentially encouraging the workers to rise up and take a stance on their own and i think one of the most interesting things about that scene as it pans back and forth is that every time it hits the place where you have this, you know, intellectual, I think he's a member of the Communist Party, selling this work, focusing on how to essentially be more civil and work within the system, which, you know, for Godard especially would be compromising and betrayal, and how he's, you know, essentially just chanting out the name of his book and then. I believe it's something like, it used to be 570, now it's 490. And it's just this chanting of the discount. It's just, it's on discount, it's on discount. This is repeated and repeated before it fades out as the camera moves and fades in as the camera comes back. And I think it really comments on, you know, how Godard thought that the movement as a whole was losing its way, betraying its roots and trying to showcase this to the audience. Yeah, I, I also love that final scene, that final big traveling over the supermarkets. I think it's gorgeous. And I think you see Goda going back to being a formalist a bit with that. I also think it's a film about disillusionment uh, with the Communist Party, with the syndicates. He was already pretty disillusioned, I think, before. But now he's looking at things kind of externally, not feeling that he is part of the movement anymore, I, I would say. And I think that makes his views more interesting. I think you see it through the character of Yves Montand, who is kind of a Godard stand-in. 
And you also see the conflict that Godard feels himself to be in with Montand working for advertising. And I think you see that with uh, Godard having to make this slightly more commercial film with these stars. Obviously, that's reflected in, in this story. And yeah, it's, it's really the film of post-68 malaise for me. And that scene, that supermarket scene, is full of that. The bit with the com Communist Party member is kind of absurdist humor, even, because having a Communist member talk about the discount, as you mentioned, that is kind of a Bunuel touch. And I think the, the scene where the boss has to pee is also very Bunuel. I think just generally, Tu bien is, for me, a return to form, literally. He is allowing himself to use his natural talent for cinema again, which he was kind of restrained out of in the Die Vertov group. It's also a really interesting bookend to this new kind of cinema, this new political work that he's working on, starting from 68, because essentially the whole premise of it is May 1968, May 1972, which is when this was shot or presented for. And essentially, it, analyzing everything that has been happening you know, to the point where you, know, you have the Montan character speaking directly to the camera, being interviewed, talking about how you know, he was involved in a new wave, seen such a long time ago, how he was swept up in 68, how so many other people were as well, and just how everyone went along with their own lives afterwards. And I think it, like, there's a lot of self-criticism. So it's not just a criticism for the party, and criticism for the unions, a criticism for where the movement is right now. It's also criticism of himself because... We don't know how inspired the Montan character is from Godard, but you see him talking about how, you know, he didn't do as much as he should. He went to a couple of demonstrations. And he, he, you know, he has even the humility, you know, where he says, you know, he would see directors across the room and be wondering, like, what the hell are you doing here, given the type of films you make? And then reflecting that they probably thought exactly the same about him. So you just have this kind of disillusionment, this kind of critique of the intellectuals who are kind of involved and kind of present themselves as revolutionary, but then don't really do much, don't really participate, don't really think about, and just go on with their lives as well. And it just also just ties together this entire project in a way, which started off extremely radical, but just descending into smaller and smaller niche focuses and then ending up with this much grander scale with just a lot of confusion, disillusionments, and, and uncertainty, because I do think at the heart of this essay is just this idea that they doesn't really know the path forward. There's a call to action for the workers to stand up in essentially any way they can, but that's it. And it doesn't really seem to be able to give any further advice, whereas the previous essays were essentially handbooks in a way. They were, this is what we're doing. This is our political ideology. This is the aim. Here's there's so much uncertainty, so much critique. A decent amount of sadness, uh, and, and that's really, really interesting to watch. Yes, it's Godard admitting that he doesn't have the solution and that people will have to find the solution. It's, in a, in a sense, a film that is very contemptuous of everyone, but most especially of himself, and I think does find some kind of hope in the workers' characters, in their, I think, their honesty and their, the experience they have in doing this strike. I think in, in that sense, it is both extremely pessimistic because everyone kind of looks bad, but there is just this tiny glimmer of hope that I think makes the film work. And I just want to add one more thing, which I thought was really interesting here. Workers are trying to explain their plight to the Enfonda as a journalist, and they start to explain their working conditions, etc., until they literally stop because they realize they're saying exactly the same thing as the union rep would say. This this kind of element, like you know, this is a film about you know a factory strike, a factory sit in, a factory takeover, but it's kind of critiquing this thing that every single time this is done, this is shown. It's like someone sees a factory for the first time. People come in and they say, you know, oh, this is sad. You know, these are not great working conditions, and then they leave. This is essentially what the film does as well, but it's self-critical enough to just implant this idea that this isn't enough, and that the workers just don't have the words to express the reality right now. And I think there's this lack of a voice, this lack of knowing what to say and what can break through to viewers as a whole. It, it's also, it, it's very understated. It's not something that's shown a great amount of focus, but it also feels like a pivotal scene. And it is also really fascinating that this was essentially the end of an era. Sigurd Werther Group would disband shortly after. They made a really short essay film 
called Letter to Jane, which is addressing itself to Jane Fonda after the event. And then the group is No More. Godard teams up with Amri Mirville, who he would eventually end up in a relationship with for at last of the States, a 50 year relationship. And they would together form uh, the production company Sonny Marsh, which was active until the very beginning of the 80s. So encompassing the entirety of the rest of the 70s. And even though they're not as productive as the Sega Vertov group, this is also a period which is incredibly important to Godard as an artist. It shows a lot of development. And I think it also showcases this kind of partnership with a more equal partner. You can see and feel how Godard dominates within the Sierra Vertov group. But with his partnership with Mirville, his cinema drastically changes. He was always known for this sarcastic double-edged sword where almost anything can be seen as both ironic and true at the same time. In the later films, this is toned down to a large extent. You get something a lot more earnest, and the essays become in many ways a lot calmer and clearer, but also a lot more distance, because what Mirabel and Godard's relationship really developed into is a further focus on what the cinematic medium can do. And one of the highlights of this is Numero Du, which plays on the ability to have two screens at the same time they play with projection and also the, from a formatic perspective so incredible is that they do split screens with two TVs so you will have for instance a scene unfolding with one character on one TV another character on the other TV still interacting sometimes with its jointed images sometimes with the same scene you see scenes of conversation juxtaposed on top of each other it's just this interplay on how the medium works and especially given the title, these two different screens once again. And what is also interesting is that even though it's so distancing and so theoretical in its visual art and form, it is also a really clear and succinct essay on the power relationships within a family, seeing the husband and wife clash and interposing sex, calling itself both a film about politics and a porn. And it does so many unusual, especially for Godard, and interesting things here. It feels more personal. It feels more intimate. And this intimacy is also contrasted by how distant it is. It's really one of the most complex works Godard ever participated in. And it stands the reason why it's really held up, even though only by a handful of critics and academics, as one of his most important works. I really enjoyed Numero Du. It was a very surprising and challenging film for me. I found it very similar to watching a Michael Snow movie. So with like the experimental films of Michael Snow, he's got a film like So Is This, which is just words on a screen. But the way that Snow plays around with the size of the words adds a lot of humour in. And the same sort of thing happens with the two television sets in Numero Do. So often we just see the two at the same size, but sometimes one screen is larger than the other screen. Sometimes we just see one screen and we don't see the second screen. The set that we get from that comes to the point where you get shots later on in the film and you can only see one screen, and it makes you wonder, what's actually going on in the second screen? Because when the two screens are together, sometimes they complement each other, but sometimes they also contradict themselves, which is really interesting because Goddard, of course, has been quoted as saying that cinema is truth at 24 frames per second. And in the film, he's challenging what we understand to be truth. So what is true on one screen is sometimes contradicted on another screen. Something else which also seemed very much like Michael Snow to me was the way that shots would transition. You could be looking at one character and then you have like a black and white reaction shot that would sort of get pasted over it, which is very similar to what Michael Snow was doing in Corpus Colossum. But that was, of course, 27 years later, and Godard had already started doing this over here in Numero Due. 
like Chris said, a lot of it's about power relationships within the family and I guess how we view those relationships, which is really interesting. When I watched the film, I thought this is an amazingly dysfunctional couple. They are terrible parents. Just the way they're doing all this sexually explicit stuff in front of their kids, the way they walk about the house naked. But I don't know if that's necessarily uh, something that's true to it or just the way that I've been perceiving it. But it's just interesting, the power play that exists there. And even with the title, Numero Do, so who is actually number two in the household? There's also a humorous thing that the uh, woman is constipated, so you've got the uh, number twos in that way also as a euphemism for a bowel movement. And, of course, you've got the number two as the television set, so you've got the second television set in there also. And just one other thing that I think I'll mention is that it's an incredibly funny film also at times. There's an amazing part in there where all we see on the two screens is just flickering lights. The both screens start to flicker. It's like a pair of eyes. It's like in Mon Oncle, the Jacques Tati film, where you have the house there with the uh, two people at the windows and it looks like eyes. The same sort of things happening in Numero Do. So it's all about Godard having a bit of fun also with film form, which is what he's always been about. So I think this film really represents Godard and really represents him at his best when he's at his most challenging, but also at his most fun and interesting. It's not a very angry film. A lot of his later films seem very angry. I've uh, got very heavy politics in there. It's a little more, I don't know, quite lighthearted, but it's a little more relaxed maybe in Numero Do. So I think Numero Do is either a culmination or a capitulation. For me, it's definitely a culmination. I think it's my favorite of the three films we've discussed and one of my favorite Godard overall. But in some sense, it is a capitulation because he is kind of accepting that his nature or what he is, is a formalist. That's the whole political th stuff, of course, he cares about it, but what he is, is someone who is just very talented at using cinema and using it in ways that explore the form more than really the content, even though the content is interesting here as well. I think you see that, as so mentioned earlier, with the world play, and especially with the title. Numero 2 has many, many meanings possible to it. I think one of them is also number two, as in the second sex, because the film is about sex, both in terms of physical sex, obviously, we see a lot of it, and also gender relations within the couple. But when you're talking about gender relations within the couple, you are talking about gender relations as a whole, because couples are so common. I mean, it's, it's a basic part of society. So I think this, there is still a political angle to this, but one that is more suited to what Godard can actually do, which is to experiment with the form. And another way in which Numero 2 is, can have another meaning is in the way he uses those two TVs, as you mentioned. And with that, he's essentially reinventing the shot-reverse shot structure, which I think is fascinating. That impressed me a lot the first time I saw it. I can think of another film that does it so well, that really recontextualizes the way we watch films and the way we watch just simple conversations. There is this scene where you have the mother talking with the daughter and, oh no, I think it's the two children talking together. When one is talking, all of a sudden you have the, this image of her face who is uh, enlarged on screen, I guess. That's just so new at the time, something that he could only do because he was working with video. And something that really we, don't, we still don't see that much. I haven't seen the films of Michael Snow, uh, so maybe, maybe there's some of that as well there. But I think that's what I love about Numero 2 is that you both have this central relationship, which I've actually found quite tender. I, I don't necessarily agree that they're that terrible parents. I don't know that, I, that it's a great thing to be as honest about sex as they are, but it doesn't seem that bad to me either. And regardless of what one thinks, I do think the film has a lot of tenderness for those characters, which is definitely something new in Godard's film, maybe from the start. Numero 2 is probably the film I enjoyed the most out of the three films we've discussed so far. I think the first um, scene was uh, quite interesting because when um, Godard speaks directly to the camera for a few minutes because uh, it's a um, complete remake of um, the scene with uh, Yves Montand we discussed in Tout va bien, 
which I guess makes it even more obvious that uh, the character Yves Montand plays is um, Godard uh, himself. Regarding the rest of the film, the form was obviously very interesting, as uh, Mathieu mentioned. I uh, don't think it's um, something that was uh, common back then, and uh, it hasn't really been reproduced. So it's definitely a very unique film, even for um, in Godard's filmography. I, I think it's, uh, it's one of his more experimental. Maybe it was only up me, but uh, I was focusing a lot on the form of the film on the two television screens trying to make something out of what I was seeing and as a result I maybe I wasn't focusing enough on what was going on actually on those screen the, the relationship that the family had so maybe by doing this very creative setting it distracts viewers from what was actually going on on the screens another thing I think is um, interesting to point out is the fact that the film is shown on television screens. And uh, the film came out in uh, 75, which was um, back when uh, television became popular in France and uh, every household started owning a TV. I wonder if um, Godard didn't forecast the fact that television would have a huge impact on society and the way that people would now consume films through television. And maybe numéro 2, since we're talking about the different meaning of numéro 2, maybe numéro 2 is the second screen and cinema would be the first screen. I absolutely love what you said, Clem, about the uh, television screens and the fact that even though we're watching a film, we are watching television screens within the film. It reminds me a lot of one of my very favourite films, which I seem to keep mentioning in each podcast, Videodrome, and Professor Brian Oblivion in the film Videodrome refuses to appear on television except on television so it's all idea that we're seeing a screen with inside a screen which highlights the artificiality of cinema so i know something that you mentioned clem which you said you found it a bit distracting concentrating the two screens i think that's kind of intentional because god doesn't want us to relax into his film he wants us to be aware of how highly constructed it is as well as aware of the fact that we're sitting watching a film i guess again to use a video drawing um metaphor i'm sorry about this but it's sort of like the opposite of sticking your head inside a television screen and being immersed by it instead we are made hyper aware of the fact that what we are seeing is something that is being filmed and something which is being constructed i think it's extremely interesting especially because like you said it's been made during this point in time in which television screens are becoming very much a part of the home where you'd expect it to be there like very much a part of the furniture and just regarding the two screens and um, the fact that it's quite distracting it's it's really a shame smartphones weren't out at the time yeah i think we can be pretty sure that if godard made this film today it would be with smartphones <laughs> But I, I love what you were all saying uh, about the two screens and thinking what was happening on the other screen and the relationship between them. And it, it actually made me think uh, that it's possible that Godard was even saying you only see one of the screens and, and asking questions in terms of there's a power relationship, there are two people in it, you see these two screens, sometimes with two characters, sometimes with the same one in different contexts. And that it might be showing that TV or just you personally will only see one of these. You won't get the full story. But also adding to uh, the form focus you've been talking about, uh, how distracting it is. I, I actually think it creates creative ways uh, to create tension. And tension within the image is one of the main things that Godard does so well, and which is one of the things I personally have loved Godard for from the very beginning, in the sense that almost every single film starts off with the idea of, how do we make a film work? Almost every single film is in some way a mini experiment on its own and how you can still maintain interest. And the fact that you have these two screens glaring out of you in complete darkness creates so much suspense. I mean, going back to Godard's long introduction as well, like the suspense stays, and the way he's able to do it, or the way he and Mirvel is able to do it, is incredibly impressive, because it's really just one shot of him talking, but you have his face somewhat obscured, a television set behind him, 
showing his face talking and a projector in the other direction and making noises. This is this interplay, this duality of two Godard, the projector and the noise, you're just drawn into this frame and he manages to keep your attention there, which I think is just so impressive. And the final note on just this kind of contradiction within it between the very important essay and story of power relationships and the form, I can definitely see a point here and going into Godard films largely for the form certainly influenced me so that I was far more focused on the form than the relationships themselves, at least the first time. But as this was a rewatch for me, I managed to appreciate the actual essay and the story a lot more too. And it, it may be that it will work very different for people giving their experience, whereas someone who's not interested in form will still get the essay and someone interested in form but not interested in the materials essay will still get the form. So you can still work in, well, two ways. So I think that's also quite interesting. And tying back to what you were all saying about the relationship itself, I would actually be more on the side of mature in the sense of tenderness. It's certainly, especially from the modern morality, a little bit of putting in some ways. But you do get close to these characters and do feel the tenderness between the family and relationships, which is also contrasted with violence. Because what is so interesting in the essay itself and what they choose to show is, again, the dysfunctionality of the couple, but also the tenderness with the couple. You see the loving embraces, you see the calm way they explain sex and love to their children, but then you also see, you know, moments that are far more violent, which I don't want to get into, but I just think this is also contrasted really well and creates this kind of, again, duology of the contrast in the relationship. So there's just so much going on in this film. One thing I would like to add on the point of TV, which you guys made some excellent points about that, is also how intimate the film is. I think that is one characteristic of TV, right? TV is in your own home. You have a much more maybe intimate relationship with the things you see on TV than the things you see in the cinema. And conversely, this is a very intimate film about, among other things, sex, and also the way it approaches the relationship, again, is, is quite intimate. I also think on that point, it's worth talking about uh, Anne-Marie Mieville, who is, I think, credited as a co-director. She's basically the third muse that Godard has after Anna Karina and Anne Wieszemski, which who was involved in the two previous films we talked about. But maybe Chris can say more about that. Well, I do think that what separates this relationship from the previous relationship is that with Mirabel, you, you can really feel it's an equal partner. And it's also felt in the shift, this drastic shift from Godard's more sarcastic, full-on humor, the kind of things he was doing to this more, you could call it video art in a way, like this very different focus on form and light, which does feel like a natural continuation but also takes the departure in just how it's shown. And it's interesting that, you know, Godard in many ways even credits Mabel for putting this focus into the film. Mabel is actually the person who's reading up some of the dialogue in the film too. And this is also something that's consistent in their partnership where both of them will narrate films as the man and the woman. I, I do think that the influence she had in this work is much greater. Uh, they had a production company together and they really worked as equal partners. So I, I think this just really interesting that you get both a new kind of cinematic experimentation and a new focus, you know, moving from this kind of grand systematic agitation to the politics of interdimensional relationships. Mary is far more than a muse. She is just, she's an equal partner in all of these films and you can really feel the impact she had on Godard. Matthew and Chris keep talking about all the tenderness between the characters. My reading of the film was very different, as I sort of alluded to earlier on. I felt they're a highly dysfunctional family, and just the way the parents dealt with sex and all things sexual reminded me a lot of the Sam Mendes film, Away We Go, where Maggie Gyllenhaal and her husband play two characters who actually have sex in the uh, same bed that they're sleeping with their children, so while the children are in the bed. And the couple just reminded me of that. And I guess, I don't know, maybe I sound like a bit of a prude, but I just felt the whole way they were showing off, you know, parts of the body, the way they would, the adults would um, dance around the house naked, would um, encourage their children to dance about in the underwear. 
the way the mother explained to the daughter that the hold on her body is where the bath water goes. A lot of it just seemed a very, um, I don't know, it just seemed to me like they weren't quite coping with being parents or not quite coping with being able to explain things to their kids and dealing like mature adults would do, which is sort of how you would see with that dysfunctional relationship, whereas we see they're not quite as happy as they seem. Yeah, I don't know. The family are definitely quite close. They do explain things in a calm manner to their kids. I sort of felt they were showing a maybe cross-section of society, which isn't really coping that well. And I don't know if that ties into the television culture. and Maybe the whole idea that everybody's, you know, obsessed with sitting down and watching things on television these days. They're not getting around to explaining and talking through other issues in a different way. But, you know, it's just my reading that I brought to the film. Don't like to think of myself as a prude, so I don't know if it's just the way that I approached it. So just to clarify, I think what I meant with tenderness is more the way the film approaches the character. I feel there's a tenderness there. There is also some between the characters, but also there is fighting, and certainly they're not perfect. I would not call them dysfunctional, but that's up for debate. I think what's really interesting is it does show the bad and the good. So I do think that you do get tender sweet scenes between the parents and the children, between husband and wife, and you do get some scenes that are highly questionable, but you do get scenes which are more violent. And I think that it's trying to, in many ways, showcase the complexity of the family unit and all of the issues and the problems and the conflicts that can arise that may seem mundane, but have a very different effect and just take all of this in and put it together into one work. And I think that's one of the main strengths of the piece as well, that it does explore all of these contradictions, the contradiction between love and the power dynamics in itself, which can even get a little bit grotesque. There's one comment on the way the parents act as well. I think this may also be just a matter of shifting morals, because if you go back to the 70s, the way parents act, interacted with the children was quite different. I mean, you can see this even in films you know, from Scandinavia, where it was also n- normal to have been nude around your children, etc. So I do think that this is just a way that society has shifted. And that's why modern audiences might react a little differently. Well, that's a completely fair point, Chris. And I think a lot of it's probably about the baggage that, as a viewer, I'm bringing to it, or as a viewer in the 21st century that I'm bringing to it by watching the film. I do like what you say about the family power dynamics and of course the person who has the most power in the entire film actually isn't any of the characters but it is Godard himself because he's deciding which television set to show us whether he shows us both set or just one set how big the television sets are so he's the person who has the most power over them so I guess from that point of view I felt the characters were more pawns in his movie so they were sort of playing and manipulating them around so, uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I can understand the tenderness. It's just not quite what I felt while watching it. I did joke about that he's actually got a lot of contempt for the characters, like the movie Contempt. But I guess maybe it's just the whole distancing thing, viewing it through two screens with a blackness in between. But I didn't feel like Godard really loved the characters in as much that he loved exploring uh, different uh, dynamics between the characters. Just worth quickly mentioning that regarding the film Contempt, there is actually a scene here that reminded me a lot of the scene in which Piccoli is describing Brigitte Bardot's body. And you have a very similar scene here. I think they are kind of sister films in a sense, very different views of relationships. I think it's also really interesting that, and this is an essay film, so you can't really spoil it. In the final scene, you actually have these points brought that it is Godard who is you know, the manipulator, and even get accusations from the main actress in the form of him choosing what to tell, him forming the story and leaving it whenever he feels like it. It opens and ends with Godard, and it ties in this power dynamic, this form of representation into the film as well. And this form of just bringing in everything at once, every sensibility, contrasting views and the film working in so many different facets really represents what Godard and Mirabel would do for the rest of the decade as well. You see it in here and elsewhere where they took material that was shot by the Sega Werther group and recut it into their own work. And it feels so much closer this too. You do 
feel the juxtaposition between what's happening in France, what's happening there, elsewhere. And even there, you also have the family watching TV and representation of the world still plays into it. And even more interesting, though they're hardly seen and essentially impossible to get, Godard Mill would also make two TV shows in this period, focusing on the same things, increasing the tenors, increasing the play and the creativity, and just how you can explore form, but not in cinema, on TV and in the television medium. And Numero Dux is a really good starting point for all of this. And this is also a really good way to wrap it up. But before we leave it, I just want to ask each co-host to, one, one final time, tell our listeners whether or not they should seek out Godard's work from the 70s. I definitely think people should uh, check out Godard's film from the 70s. I hope we manage to show the film in a light that uh, makes people want to seek out his work. I would suggest, however, not to start with... Um, this period of uh, Godard, if you're new to him, maybe start with his um, earlier film from the 60s. Uh, I think that would be a better introduction. Even though um, Mathieu said that uh, Numero 2 was the first film he saw of Godard and he actually enjoyed it. So maybe you can start with uh, this one and see how you feel about the rest. But uh, overall, I think is um, if you like Godard, in general, there is absolutely no reason you wouldn't like his film from the 70s. So I would say, in any case, just yeah, go for it. I definitely agree with that sentiment. Though, even though I saw Numero 2 first, I maybe would not recommend that. Seeing it again for the podcast, I really saw how much more I got out of it, knowing Godard's work much better, especially the two films before it that we discussed. I think, yeah, the 70s Godard is very interesting. I would specifically recommend Numero 2, but even the Digavert of stuff, even though it's not my thing, is just interesting to see both in terms of his personal evolution and also just how left intellectuals of the time were reacting to what was going on in the world. I would, of course, highly recommend Godard's 1970s output. I don't know if I recommend it as a starting point, but that's just because it wasn't a starting point for me. Personally, watching a whole bunch of his 80s films, I've been cut up how many, but it was really interesting going back and looking at the 70s stuff, the stuff he did between his most acclaimed period to the stuff like Nom Carmen and Hail Mary in the 1980s. So for me, it was very interesting approaching it that way. I don't know if it's necessarily a bad point to start off with our numero do and to Vabian. It might be a good starting point, but depending that you know what you're in for. Like if you've seen enough experimental films, especially like I mentioned before, the films of Michael Snow, I think you'd be feeling really comfortable watching 70s Goddard. If you've never seen an anti-narrative film before, it might not be the best place to start. But um, otherwise, yeah, I think both films are quite watchable and I think they would appeal quite well to film goers who have already seen a few other experimental and anti-narrative films in their time. Yeah, I think I agree with all of you in that this probably shouldn't be your starting point. Like The most accessible work for Goddard is from the 60s. And if you can follow that, evolution and end up loving Lashana and Weekend, there is a pretty clear path into the Sega world of stuff. Similarly, if you are one of the Godard fans who love his 80s and 90s later work, if you, for instance, loved his most recent film, The Image Book, or you're one of the people who highlight his raw to cinema as one of his best work, you really need to go back and see his collaborations with Mirabel, because this is where so much of that actually started, to play with not just form, but with the medium in a televisual way, the, the kind of credits he would later use, the type of video art he would later play with. All of that really starts here. If you like his later work, you really owe it to yourself to go back and see the Murdu here and elsewhere, and his other collaborations with Anne-Marie Neville. And with that, thank you for listening, and join us again soon. You have been listening to Talking Images, the official podcast of ICMforum.com. <laughs>